Uh, today's scripture comes from Matthew 28, verses 9 to 11, and verses 16 to 17. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and, they, <clears throat> and there they will see me. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain of which, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The heart wants what the heart wants. Have you ever heard that phrase? Um, if you're a fan of the Hallmark Channel, if you know about it, uh, it's predominantly known for its romance movies. And I have to admit that I've watched a few. Uh, the Christmas ones, uh, even as I try to be kind of a tough guy, they, they kind of pull on heartstrings, and, and I've uh, only watched them because Linda asked me to watch them with her. <laughs> uh, no, but I have to admit, yeah, there, there's, maybe there's a tiny bit of a sap in me, and, and it's like, ah, what a nice story. Um, but the tagline of this channel is, the heart wants what the heart wants. And basically it means follow your heart. Right? That, isn't that what generally the world's understanding of love and romance is about? Follow your heart. Listen to your heart. You can't deny what you're feeling. Okay? Uh, if you remember Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, uh, he was trying to be one step ahead of that. Uh, and thinking of more from now, uh, you know, just a product standpoint and business and, and sales and so forth, he said famously, some people say give the customers what they want. But that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. Wow. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. So he would also agree that the heart wants what the heart wants, but he's trying to stay one step ahead of what you think you want. Um, we say generally, maybe you've heard it if you've grown up in the church, I don't know if it's used so much out in secular psychology and whatever, but we talk about felt needs. Right? What we feel right on the surface, what is sort of obvious to us, and then real needs, deeper needs that the average human being isn't usually normally in touch with. We're usually just in touch with our felt surface needs. And, and what we, when we want what we want, it's usually those surface things. So I agree in significant degree to what Steve Jobs was saying here, that we have needs even beyond what we realize. Uh, that there are deeper needs that we don't even realize we have, and he's trying to be someone who can get ahead of the curve and therefore sell to your needs. Okay? Now, let's um, summarize this whole notion of heart wanting and feeling needs with this one word, desire. When you desire something, right? The scriptures speak a lot about our desires, even desiring God. It's a good thing. Desire in and of itself doesn't have to be bad. It can be a wonderful thing to desire good things, righteous things, true things. So I want you to think of desires in uh, just the idea of a tree, okay? And if you think of a fruit tree, desires, I want to su suggest to you, are actually like the fruit of the tree. It's, it's what we see on the surface, what we feel on the surface, our felt desires and needs. Uh, but the fruit in any normal healthy tree, where does it come from? It doesn't come from thin air. It's grown. It's produced from way below the ground. It begins below the ground where the roots go down in the unseen. And as it sucks up all the nutrients and water, and then it produces where we can, it can be seen. So let's try to connect it this way. Again, I want to suggest to you that our desires are actually like the fruit of our lives. And what the ground is, is actually our culture. It's, it's the city we live in. It's, it's our society. It's our, our city's morals and ethics, our, our advertising, our, our economy, everything, our culture. And our desires don't just come out of nowhere. Because we live in Toronto, a Western, technological, socialistic uh, society, and I could go on and on and on and on about things that describe our culture here, then whether you like it or not, that's why you desire certain things. Case in point, 
I'm just going to pick arbitrarily Africa. Let's go to, let's see if we go there. They, generally speaking, have a lot of different desires. They're very different people. But it's because of the culture that they're living in. Okay? And so desire, another synonym for it then, is worship. Worship to the normal person walking the street uh, is a religious word. It, it sounds religious. But whether you consider yourself religious or not, I, I want to bring this word down to earth, and basically it's just a synonym for desire. What we desire, we end up worshiping. And, and I'll give a definition of worship in a second that hopefully will convince you that it, it's really an everyday thing that normal people do all the time. In fact, we're always worshiping someone or something because we're always desiring something. Worship, bottom line, is about what we desire ultimately. Now, just to start defining it, to try to understand worship, we say this uh, around here often that worship is really about worthship. Whatever is worth it to you, whoever is worth it to you, whatever you desire is probably worth it to you, and so you're willing to put an effort to try to experience it, to try to gain it, to have it in your life. So worship is really about worship. Now as we end Matthew, uh, we begin a new, at least in the church calendar, what we call a ministry, or kind of like a fiscal year, but a ministry, or September to August is, is kind of a normal ministry year for churches. And so uh, every uh, first three Sundays of September, we just want to revisit um, not any new novel vision. It's not a vision for you know, anything unique per se, but just to come back to the basics of the vision that Scripture gives us, that Jesus has given us. And at Trinity Grace Church, our vision, our, our way of just articulating uh, and saying what Christ has called us to is to overflow His grace, to overflow His grace into a new culture, a new community, and a new city. And today we're going to focus on that new culture bit. And so that's why I've been getting us to think about culture. And it, it, culture is really the ground, the soil from which desires are produced. And so Christ's vision for a new culture that he creates, a new way of looking out onto the world, is his vision for worshiping people a people who are very awake to their deepest real desires, their real needs, meaning they are supremely glad because of this Jesus. That's Christ's vision. And in his gospel, it creates a, a radically countercultural new culture. And so uh, today's sermon is entitled, Be Glad, Be Glad. We're supposed to be glad in this new gospel culture, in this culture of Jesus. Be glad. And so let's unpack Christ's vision for this new culture. My hope and prayer for all of us uh, is a prayer. I, I hope there's something stirring in your heart by the, the time we work through this passage and, and you'd find words in your heart, something similar to this. Lord, grow my desire and effort. Because it can't just be wishful thinking and feeling and wanting. It can't just be a desire. True desire, true worship um, actualizes. True desire and worship materializes into action, into real everyday life and choices. So Lord, grow my desire and effort to see more hearts worship you. Not only my own heart, but I want to see more and more hearts worship you. So I want to ask for the rest of our time together, uh, what does worshiping Jesus as our deepest desire look like? And in today's passage, we see that his disciples worship, especially we have to see it's after the fact of his resurrection. Okay? Our proper response to a resurrected Jesus is worship, is to desire him, is to be satisfied by him in the deepest place. So the first thing that I want you to see with me, if you haven't already, I hope you'll be convinced now, but the whole introduction pretty much has been about the fact that we all worship. Whether you consider yourself religious or irreligious, 
We all worship something or someone, meaning we all desire someone or something and we prioritize our lives around that. So to try to define worship, whether you are a Christian or not, worship, practically speaking, is prioritizing your everyday life around what you believe is a worthy, and I think there are four things we can break down what we deem worthy in life. First, a story. Whatever you deem a worthy story, you prioritize your life around that. And we live in the age of story. We live in the age of narrative. In our culture right now, what you hear a lot, and if you read the headlines again and again and again, you see pop up this whole trend and and this notion of narrative and speaking your truth. We live in the age more than uh, in, in times past where people want to express themselves and they look out on life through a certain narrative and it makes sense of their life. And that naturally leads to a system in life. All of us, whether you've taken the time to really sort it out for yourself and to articulate it and and write it out perhaps in your journal or, or just to really organize it in your mind, we all have a system. We all have a way of going through the everyday Uh, motions of life and making decisions. We all have a system. And so worship is all about, practically speaking, prioritizing your everyday life around a system that you deem worthy. Maybe it's capitalism. Probably for a lot of us, whether we realize or not, it is living in this capitalistic society. And we want to accrue as much as we can. We want to, and even for the Christian, sometimes we fall into that ditch of prioritizing Uh, financial security and so forth. Then which leads to the next thing because our story and our system, it produces what, we we pick the system that that we believe will produce the best security for us, the best stability, the best standing in society and, and amongst family and so forth. And of course, all this, the end goal, and for every human being, I think if they're honest, it's about satisfaction. It's about, put it differently, happiness. Am I happy at the end of the day because of the story that I see my life through and the system that I choose and the security that I'm going after? Does it make me happy? Now, I want to back up. And the reason why we read a few verses before is because it was last week's passage, but it really sets up today's verses. And so I want to go back to that a little bit. Uh, these verses weren't read per se, at least verse, uh, yeah, I think 12 and 15 weren't read, but let's look at them. And so here we have the guards. Now remember, these guards, I think the most important characteristic about them is the fact that they witness, they eyewitness the resurrection scene. They eyewitness the great earthquake and the angel that came and rolled the stone away. They saw all this with their own eyes. Scripture doesn't say, Matthew doesn't record if they actually saw Jesus walking out or not. But nevertheless, just the excitement, the, the power and the magnitude of that resurrection scene, they eyewitnessed, but for a sufficient sum of money. So they had a system. They had a story. They wanted to be comfortable financially. They wanted to be secure financially. They wanted some gain, and for a sufficient sum of money, they were willing to lie even to themselves and to deny what they witnessed with their own eyes. What point in life do you have to get to to be willing to deny truth, to lie to yourself? There's a sufficient sum of whatever it is that defines your security and satisfaction, then it's a real temptation for all of us. Now, Christian worship then, Christian worship, practically speaking, is prioritizing your everyday life around the gospel's most worthy and all the same thing story system security satisfaction the gospel defines these things for us our story isn't defined by looking deep within ourselves and 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 figuring out who we are no we let god tell us who we are in him who he's created us to be how we are find our worth and are worthy And, and then we look out on the world And we see that God has actually ordered this universe, that he's really uh, just designed this universe with his system, and it's all his wisdom, all his science, and and everything on and on and on. And our security is not uh, our horses and chariots, as the Psalms say, but our security is Christ and his perfect work. 
and to grow into finding more and more happiness in Christ. This is the journey. This is Christian worship. And it becomes very practical in the everyday. Every day where you're waking up and instead of just looking to that therapy app that speaks wonderful stories and ocean sounds and that's all helpful and it works because we're human we're designed that way but instead of stopping there to have the words of scripture wash over you to have the story of the gospel that as you wake up to remember you are my redeemed son you are my redeemed daughter and therefore i am your god and i have plan and purpose for you today in Christ, to continue to live on mission. And and whatever you say and do today, wherever you are, there's goodness to it because you're in my gospel story and working towards that great end of Christ's kingdom. Well, moving on then. We worship. But what does it look like to, to worship Jesus as our deepest desire? I want you to see with me next that we worship the vindicated Jesus. Vindicated. Uh, if you're not familiar with that word, it, it, it basically means where uh, you were being accused of something and then someone proves and declares that you're actually innocent. And just that feeling, just that feeling, just that feeling of no one likes being falsely accused or misunderstood or, or being mistakenly thought of as wrong and then to be vindicated. What a freedom. And Jesus himself was in need of this. Because the world, as they looked on Jesus being crucified, the worst possible criminal's death at that time, even in history, you could argue, he was being misunderstood and everyone was ready to write him off as a fraud. And we see that he's vindicated. How how is he vindicated? How is he vindicated? Well, going back to verse 8, I think we we see it here in that these women who also came to uh, the open tomb and they're given instructions by the angel to go and tell the other disciples that the Jesus who was crucified that you're looking for is risen. And so notice their reaction. They departed quickly from the tomb. And Matthew goes as far as describing what's going on in their hearts, what they're feeling with fear and great joy. And they ran. They departed quickly and ran to tell his disciples. Now, why? Why fear and great joy? This is a tug of war. This is a tension. These are kind of opposite emotions, but this is something beautiful, and this is something fitting for the Christ follower to have this tension in our hearts even now as Christ followers in 2021. There should be a healthy fear and great joy. Why? I believe because, going back to an image that I shared last week, think of these dominoes falling. The the, the great fear is that because Jesus rose from the dead, because, let's say, this domino is his resurrection, and it's fallen, that means every other domino before it, everything that Jesus said and did and what happened to him is true. It's true. The resurrection proves that everything that Jesus taught about the kingdom coming, about a a, a holy God who will also judge wicked servants, that he'll separate the sheep and the goats, that we can be filled with the Spirit, and that the Father is a loving Father who longs to give the good gift of the Spirit. And we go on and on and on about everything that Jesus taught. Because Jesus rose from the dead, because that domino fell, it means everything about Jesus is true. So I think that's both the fear and the joy mixed together. Fear because, oh my goodness, this is true. And that's why everyone needs to make a decision about the resurrection. And everyone has to contend with the resurrection. You you can't ignore Jesus' resurrection because if it's true, I mean, that's why a lot of people don't want to think about it. That's why a lot of people don't want to go deep into the things of Christ because they know if they go down that trail, they'll realize, oh my goodness, he really did rise from the dead, which means everything he taught is true. And so, of course, 
I'll be the first to say, I fear standing before a living God on that final judgment day. What will happen to me? And, and if Jesus said there are only two eternities, two possibilities of heaven and hell, his resurrection proves that that is the truth. See, God is vindicating him by raising Jesus from the dead. God the Father, by the power of the Spirit, raising him is saying everything that Jesus said and did was perfect and righteous and true. He fulfilled the law. He was sinless. He is an acceptable sacrifice to me for all the sins of humanity. He is a perfect and acceptable substitute for everyone who would place faith in him. So that draws out fear in me. That, that elicits fear, but also it elicits joy because what else did Jesus teach? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Meaning if we're in union with Christ, then our eternity is the new creation, is to be in God the Father's love forever and to do life redeemed as his children as he meant life to be. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> we need more of those. Be free to, to respond and, and holler. So what, what I want you to see with me next then, and it really just flows from the fact that Jesus is vindicated, we worship the living Jesus. How did God the Father vindicate his son? The Psalms foretold that God would not let his anointed one rot in the grave. And the way to vindicate someone, the way you vindicate, say, someone indicted for a crime and assuming that they truly are innocent of that crime, how do you vindicate them? You set them free from prison. You give them back life. And God the Father does the exact same for his son. He brings him back to life. This is the highest statement of vindication that the Father could declare upon his son to raise him back to life and then to lift him up to his right hand. Now, this living Jesus, Matthew takes pains to describe this living Jesus, that a living Jesus is worshipped. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. Okay? When it says greetings there, Perhaps for some of us, our, our culture, our age, uh, your greeting, your warm greeting is like, what's up? Or like, yo, right? For some of us, it's just a hearty, firm handshake, and that is your warm greeting. For some of us, it's a hug, a warm hug and embrace, or a kiss on the cheek. Maybe that is your culture and your thing. But the point is, whatever your warm greeting is, this is what's going on here. Jesus is warmly greeting these uh, women here first as friend, as reconciled. And Jesus meets them. The risen Jesus meets them. And I don't think it's a wrong application to be comforted by this truth for you and me today. This risen Jesus, he longs to meet us every morning. Love how Matthew Henry puts it in his commentary. Every day and all days and every hour, our Jesus is with us. Believers shall have the constant presence of their Lord always, all days, every day. There is no day, no hour of the day in which our Lord Jesus is not present with his churches and with his people. If there were in that day, that hour, this is profound, but I agree with Matthew Henry, they would be undone. If Jesus is not with his people, with you, every day, every hour, then you would be undone. Your, your, your faith would not your faith would fail if it were not for God's grace constantly with you by the indwelling Spirit. Jesus meeting you each and every day through His Spirit, through His Word. Let's take a moment just to define uh, disciple, to be just reminded of what it means to be a disciple 
of Jesus, to, to follow Jesus, to be a Christ follower. To put it in the simplest terms, it's to hear and obey. These women, they not only saw Jesus, but they heard his greeting and they knew it was him and they ran to him. They fell at his feet. They worshipped him. Notice that there is the word, worship. To worship. It means to, to fall and to adore. It means even the word worship here, it comes from another Greek word which is used for uh, a, a dog in the most um, uh, beautiful sense, uh, an adorable sense, a dog that is just lapping up water because it is so thirsty. It's quenching its thirst. And, and the word for worship comes from that. We fall at our feet and we're drinking in to find quenching for our thirst and to find life. And so these women, they, they meet Jesus and they fall at his feet. They worship and so disciple, they, they hear him, and they, they go toward him. So to hear and obey. We're defining disciple. To hear and obey. To elaborate on that, we hear through, one, spirit-dependent. Okay? The, the Christ follower grows in an uh, increasing dependency. And this is not not hard. It doesn't mean out, have to be outward, just in your heart, in your mind, the thought, the quick thought, the split-second thought, Lord, I depend on you to have that attitude in your heart. The spirit-dependent to prayerful reading of Scripture. To meditate on Scripture, Old Testament and New. Spirit-dependent, prayerful reading of Scripture. And from there, as Paul the Apostle says to his protege, Timothy, I want you to learn, develop, to guard these sound teachings, these doctrines. And so as we meditate, spirit-dependent on Scripture, we'll form more and more a clear system, a clear understanding, a clear knowledge, a clear theology, whatever word you want to use, a clear way to understand who God is, how He has created this world, how, why and, 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 and how it fell into sin, and how He redeems us, and now how we are to live as His redeemed people. And then we make daily choices in line with those beliefs that embody Jesus and that honor Jesus, okay? Now, a sad reality in life, a sad reality is not enjoying the grace, especially for the Christian, is not enjoying the grace that is there for you in Christ. This Jesus, he is with you. He greets you. His heart for you is greeting Jesus is the Savior who is also friend. This beautiful tension. He is God unapproachable, but also friend. And he is the friend who is closer than a brother. But I hope you'll also see with me then. We worship Jesus so others may worship. We worship Jesus so others may worship. Remember going back to that Sort of introductory prayer, Lord, grow my desire and effort to see more people worship you. And this is the effort part we're talking about. God's grace always works itself out uh, into effort, into good works, into living this out. And so we worship Jesus so others may worship. Very practically speaking, uh, if you get to know me, you know that I'm an avid cyclist. And my cycling buddies, of whom probably all of them, uh, are, or most of them, they're, they're not believers, um, but they cycle a lot sat Sunday mornings. They're probably cycling right now. And they always ask, Albert, like they let me know what, what they're up to, and then they go, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're a pastor. <laughs> right? So even practically speaking, literally, me coming here to worship with the saints, it becomes a witness. And at some point, I hope they'll try to think through this and figure it out. Like, hmm, what makes a person willing to give up Sunday mornings and, and forego all the wonderful cycling that they could do with us uh, and instead to go worship? I hope they're cycling at church. <laughs> you know, that's probably what they're thinking, right? 
but we worship Jesus so that others may worship. Our gathering faithfully Sunday mornings. I know these are pandemic times and we need to have some grace for, you know, just pandemic times and, and what worship looks like. But the ideal that we need to keep working towards is gathering in person physically as his body, his local church. And so we worship Jesus so others may consider our, our, our presence, our witness. And what do they do every Sunday morning? Why do they do it? And so we see, I want to go back to verse 8. These are the women again, and, and, and I want you to notice another aspect of it. They departed quickly from the tomb with great fear and great joy. We already talked about that. And ran to tell. When's the last time you were so excited that you ran, even tripped over something because you were so excited and there was something in front of you you didn't notice? And when was the last time you ran towards someone to tell someone something? But here is effort. Here is energy being, you know, coming out from these women's hearts as they worship this risen Jesus. And then notice the result. We jump to verse 17. And when they saw him, the, the, these are, the they here are the rest of the disciples. And so the women did their job. They, they were worshiping so that others may worship. They ran And when the other disciples saw him as well, they worshipped him. That's the end goal. To long for Jesus. That Jesus would become our greatest desire. And he doesn't just stay as a desire that we long for it to be fulfilled. No, Jesus, he's the best in that he satisfies us. He meets us. He really does even indwell us by his spirit when we place our faith in him. And they saw him. So our job, our worship is so important because we're displaying Jesus. As a church, any church, every local church would do well to look in the mirror and say, how is our worship? Is our worship befitting to our great and wonderful God? Is our worship clear and understandable? And are we proclaiming the gospel clearly and reasonably so that even an outsider could understand, could leave if they come in on a worship service that they leave understanding more of who this Jesus is and what it means to place faith in him. So very practically speaking, Christian worship displays Jesus through, and and I just want to point out three aspects of our our, our worship. Okay. Now I, I have to admit, I've been talking more about gathered worship, but even before that, worship is a lifestyle. Christian worship displays Jesus through our lifestyle. And here I'm talking about first tomorrow when you go to work or you go to school. First, between you and God, your motive. Your motive will be absolutely different than all your non-believing friends and coworkers. You'll be working unto God. You'll be working unto Christ He is your your ultimate teacher and principal or director and boss, CEO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're working unto him first. And that's a lifestyle thing. That's an attitude. But certainly lifestyle can play out into practical uh, scheduling and things you do and the things you put into your schedule, like coming on a Sunday. And, And so for certain, our service here, our Sunday worship service, or when there's a Christian funeral, or Christian wedding, or your weekly gatherings, your smaller uh, gatherings, your midweek gatherings, and smaller pockets of Christian community. These literal concrete expressions are, are, are worship. And of course, whether it's our lifestyle, whether it's in our daily conversations, I mean, we so easily are ready to commend other products and, and podcasts and whatnot that are helpful. I hope that we could get to a place of comfort, comfortability and courage where, where we could just talk, commend Jesus, basically. Commend Jesus and how he's better than whatever therapy app that other people are using or, or whatever other thing that people look to as their system, their story, their security, their satisfaction. And so certainly, worship is about praise. Bottom line, 
Worship is praise, praising our God, praising our Father, praising the Spirit, commending Him to the world. So let me try to summarize this point. John Piper, he he puts it so beautifully, so succinctly in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. Um, It's probably the one line that people remember from this book, but he, he puts so wisely and beautifully, missions exist because worship doesn't. And so even how we worship can be a part of our mission. But we worship and we, we do missions. We, we make effort, whether it's to go overseas and to support missionaries there or ourselves sending people out. We support organizations here, whether it's our own personal witness and taking opportunity to tell others about Jesus. All of that mission exists because we want to see more and more people come to worship Jesus to organize their life, to prioritize their life around Him. And so even our worship is a part of that mission because we want to see others worship. But finally, this passage ends with a little bit of warning. I want you to see with me that we worship Jesus by the Holy Spirit's enabling. There's something mind-blowing and and just Head scratching here. So the disciples, they, they saw Jesus, the risen Jesus, and they are experiencing that tension of great uh, fear and great joy. And, and now they realize, oh my goodness, if the domino of the resurrection had fallen, then what does that mean for everything Jesus has taught and said and done? It's all true. But even in the face of the risen Jesus, flesh and blood, seeing the scars In his hands and feet, some doubted. Some doubted. Now, this is not a a positive thing. Like, you know, every Christian, myself included, as you journey through life, as as things come out of left field and, and, you know, get the hard knocks of life, your faith goes through ups and downs. Even the psalmists, in their way, they doubted, always returning, but yet put your hope in God but they went through their doubts. But this is not what we're talking about here. Matthew here is is referring to people who didn't believe. And this is is absolutely confusing for me because if you're standing before the risen Jesus and you're seeing him flesh and blood, how can you not believe? The only answer is, what the whole counsel of God teaches. If you read the Bible faithfully from beginning to end, you'll see that apart from the Spirit's enabling, apart from the Spirit imparting grace to bring your soul, to to wake up your heart, there won't be belief. There won't be faith. And that's why I want you to see with me that we worship by the Spirit's enabling. And so what this means for our effort the best place to start as we think of loved ones and coworkers and on and on is to pray, Lord, please, please let your spirit break through their hearts and minds. That is often a more potent power than, than you just talking them blue until you're blue in the face and trying to convince them. The spirit has to do something in their hearts more than judging them, more than guilt tripping them, any of that, just pray that the Spirit would enable them to see Jesus for who he is. So to land this plane, overflowing grace into a new culture means to be glad in Christ Jesus. Lord, grow my desire and effort to see more hearts worship you. Thank you.